State Representative Betsy Fogel. So here is my house district. OTC's campus is right here. So we are just outside of the 135th. I have everything north of Sunshine that also falls east of National. So if you know where that intersection is, that's my house district. I was first elected in 2020, so I've served two years in the General Assembly. Do you guys know where Missouri State's capital is? Anybody know? Jeff City. City, yep. So I spend Monday through Thursday or Friday from January through May up in Jefferson City setting our state budget, passing policy, and working on behalf of my district and the rest of the state of Missouri. I won my election in 2020 uh, by a very narrow margin, by 76 votes. So that shows the competitive nature of my district. I represent 50% of people who probably agree with me on issues who consider themselves Democrats. I'm a Democrat. 50% of my constituency probably doesn't agree with me on a lot of policy. They consider themselves to be Republicans. So when I'm in Jefferson City, I try really hard to focus on those issues that span across um, political ideology. I focus a lot on access to health care, making sure we have great public schools, and making sure we have an economy that works for everybody. My previous life, up until the day before being sworn in in Jefferson City, I worked at Jordan Valley Community Health Center. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right over there. It's a community health center that primarily provides medical, dental, and behavioral health services to our low-income neighbors or for individuals who don't have health insurance. So I worked there post-college up until the day before being sworn in and saw firsthand how the policies being made in Jefferson City trickled down and impacted my neighbors here in Springfield. So I really advocated for things like Medicaid expansion, which is a policy that passed here in the state of Missouri a few years ago, and increased access to health care to over 200,000 Missourians. I saw firsthand how individuals who were employed by me, I employed a lot of single moms that were dental assistants, medical assistants, or receptionists. They would be doing a great job, I would offer them a promotion, and they would turn it down because if they made a dollar or two dollars more an hour, they no longer would have access to child care subsidies. Their children wouldn't have access to the state's Medicaid program, and it would be cost inhibitive for them to take a pay raise, which in my mind just didn't make sense when I'm a capitalist and I want everyone to thrive in our economy. So kind of seeing how those Jefferson City policies trickle down um, to people here in Springfield made me want to jump in and run for office. So campaigned for about a year and a half, went on the ballot, won by a very narrow margin, and like I said, I spent the last two years up in Jefferson City um, trying to move Missouri forward and, and get work, good work done. Some of the highlights of my uh, legislative career, I'm really proud I worked with Senator Lincoln Huff. I don't know if he's been to this class. He's a senator here in the city of Springfield. We were able to do a lot of great stuff around child welfare and the child care crisis. We put $20 million in the state's budget to make sure that small businesses and our essential workers had access to child care. I don't know if any of you are parents in this room, but it's really hard to find affordable and quality child care for your children so you can enter into the workforce. I did a lot of work in the child welfare space, making sure that we had proper resources for our children's division, making sure that vulnerable children in our state had someone looking out for them. I don't know, again, how closely you follow the news, but you maybe have seen some of the stories where we've had unlicensed residential facilities who have been charged with abuse and neglect of children in their care. And uh, our children's division workforce that is completely understaffed, and we have children in the state sleeping under the desks of children's division workers because there's no safe place for them to go and, and to call home. So for me, again, when I'm in Jefferson City, I try really hard to focus on the things that are important to my district. And I know what's important to my district because I have knocked over 55,000 doors when we're not in legislative session. And when I'm knocking doors, I'm not telling people, hey, this is why you should vote for me. I'm asking people, hey, what do you need out of a functioning democracy? What do you need out of Jefferson City? Every bill I filed, I filed on behalf of a constituent. And I take that responsibility really seriously when I'm in Jefferson City, knowing that I'm not there for my own personal agenda. I'm there to represent the interests of my district. So that's a little bit about me, what I focus on when I'm in Jefferson City. Um, I can go into more detail about any one of those things, but I think maybe opening up for questions. Yeah, let me start off with a couple others. First of all, just a day-to-day -day basis. What's your job like? Absolutely. So. When you're an elected official, at least at the state level, you kind of have two different arms of which you operate. When I'm in Jefferson City, I kind of call that my legislative side. And days look like you know, waking up early. I serve on the state appropriation committee, which means I'm one of a handful of people who decide well, where all of our taxpayer dollars are going to go. So when I'm in Jefferson City, again, January through May, Monday through Thursday or Friday, that often looks like five, six, seven hours a day sitting in a hearing room taking testimony about our state budget. 
Then we go to the House floor where all 163 of us debate policy. We're usually on the floor two times a day for a few hours at a time. And then I also serve on several other committees, which are smaller in nature, but have about eight to 10 representatives on them. And the public can come and testify whether they love a bill or hate a bill or whether they'd like to see changes in bills. So for those of you who don't know the process of a bill becoming law, a member of the General Assembly must file the bill. The speaker must refer that bill to a committee. The committee must pass that bill out of their committee. Then it gets sent to the House floor and the whole House floor must vote whether they're going to pass or defeat that bill and then it switches chambers so it has to go from the Senate or the House over to the Senate and then the governor must sign it otherwise it doesn't become law so I am one cog in that 163 uh, people group over in the House and then once we're done with our work we send those bills over to the Senate so a lot of what I do is I, I said this earlier, I'm a Democrat here in Missouri. For those of you who don't know the makeup of the General Assembly, Democrats exist in a super minority in both the House and the Senate, which means there's very few of us. We can't pass policy without the help of our Republican colleagues. If every Democrat didn't show up to Jefferson City, Republicans could conduct business as usual. They could pass laws back and forth because that's how few Democrats there are in Jefferson City. So for me, a lot of the work I do is behind the scenes. I've passed several pieces of legislation here in Missouri, but I hand it to my Republican colleagues who pass, who file it, move it in their name, and that bill has become law. And a lot of the work that we do is behind closed doors, helping to craft policy, um, maybe from a slightly different perspective of our Republican colleagues who are really happy to work with us behind the scenes and a little less happy for us to get public credit. So as Democrats, we definitely find ways of being crafty and getting good work done for the state of Missouri. Um, probably what you see back home are headlines of the two political parties that are just always fighting, always screaming at each other. I don't, again, I don't know how closely you follow stuff, but recently in the Missouri General Assembly, we've actually seen the Republican caucus fight a lot more amongst themselves with the conservative caucus and then the, the regular Republican caucus. The last two years, their infighting has been a lot worse than fighting across the aisle. But what you don't get to read about are all the opportunities that we have to work together to pass good legislation that benefits Missouri. Just yesterday, myself, um, Senator Lincoln Hoff, and Senator Doug Beck, a Democrat um, from the St. Louis area, and Representative Riley was supposed to be there, but he had his baby. We did a, a almost two hour forum on how bipartisanship works in Jefferson City. And um, that's a message that's important to me that people don't just think we're up there screaming at each other. Sometimes that happens, but we do work really well behind the scenes. I feel like you've answered this a little bit, but can you talk directly? We had a Republican visit us yesterday. You'd identify as a Democrat. Why that party and not some other party? Absolutely. So for me, you know, up until probably the 2016 election, I would have considered myself more of an independent voter. I was not a fan of Donald Trump. I was not a fan of his policies, and I was not a fan of him personally. And I think we saw a divide happen within the Republican Party. I come from a long line of Republicans and very proud to be so, but not necessarily people who claim that the election was stolen, that vaccines are unsafe, um, rhetoric that I just personally don't agree with. So when it was time to jump in and run for office, my ideals aligned more with the Democratic Party. I'm a huge proponent of public schools. I think every child deserves access to free quality public education. I believe that the government shouldn't tell you what to do in a doctor's office. I believe that the government shouldn't tell you who you can and can't love. So I think that for me, I, I aligned more with the Democratic Party and um, have spent the last two years serving it. Oh, so I have six classes and you're, I would probably say you're, over the years I've been doing this, you are the most responsive representative I've ever dealt with. You Thank probably you. would present to all six of my classes if I asked you, but I'm, I'm not going to. As a result, I have five other classes that have written a ton of questions. I do want to open it to the floor for this room, but I also want, I feel responsible to ask questions on their behalf. Before I do, there's a couple things we need to talk about. This I did not intend for this semester to be about marijuana, but it is a big deal right now. Obviously, we have something. We should take a minute to talk about Amendment 3. I would like to talk about that with you. But there was some breaking news yesterday. The President of the United States announced a pardon for 6,500 people for being charged federally for possession of marijuana. What are your thoughts on that? And we'll go ahead and transition that into Amendment 3 on the ballot this year. Absolutely. So to set the stage for you guys a little bit, how many of you are from Missouri? pretty much everybody so you probably followed several years ago the state the people of the state opted to have medical marijuana legal here in the confines of the boundaries of Missouri so that was kind of step one 
And now, several years later, we're having um, the, the people decide yet again if we want recreational marijuana here in the state. So we moved a bill through the legislature this cycle that would have taken care of this issue on behalf of the people and made recreational marijuana um, happen here in Missouri. It was carried by Republican House members. It had a lot of momentum. It did not come to fruition. It did not pass the finish line. Again, a bill has to leave the House, go to the Senate, be signed by the governor. This bill wasn't able to accomplish that. So because the legislature wasn't able to enact um, recreational marijuana, it will now go to a vote of the people. And, and you said it well, Amendment 3 will be on your ballot. Don't forget to vote November 8th. That will be the people of Missouri deciding the fate of recreational marijuana here in the state. And there are some people out there, members of my political party, who are choosing not to support that because there's some imperfect language, I think they would say, in the ballot initiative. For me personally, I'll be supporting it. I think the right place for a person that chooses to smoke recreational marijuana is not incarceration. I think we have a lot of problems with our judicial system as it stands. And what we've seen you know, over the last decade, or several decades, is uh, the war on drugs isn't effective. And I believe this is another example of that. I think probably, you know, depending on what poll you look at, it's pretty competitive here. I think your age group will be kind of who decides where that heads. I was on Missouri State's campus two days ago for a voter fair, talked to probably 150 students. Each, each one said they were voting specifically for this, that they were registering to vote so they could vote for recreational marijuana. So I think the enthusiasm is there. There are some things in there, like I mentioned, that I don't love. Um, I wish it had a little bit more expansive, ex do you know what expungement means? expungement what which, does what does it mean so expungement means you've committed a crime but basically you have it forgiven so if you're in jail for a marijuana crime being expunged would mean you get out of jail and it's wiped from your record so I wish that there was slightly more expansive expungement protocols in there and I also don't love that it favors existing uh, medical marijuana distributors this industry as you can imagine does come with a profit and one can make an argument that the way our medical marijuana system rolled out favored certain individuals. They were able to make money off of this. For me personally, um, you know, it will keep thousands of people out of our jail systems, and I fully believe this is our last, one of our last opportunities to do it through the initiative petition process before that threshold changes. Right now in Missouri, if you put something on the initiative petition process, it ha has to pass with 50% plus one votes. The incoming Speaker of the House has been very public that he wants to change that from 50% plus one to two-thirds majority. Here in Missouri, a lot of the initiative petitions passed with 53, 54, 58% of the vote of the vote. And I don't know if recreational marijuana passes if we move it to two-thirds majority. So for me, though it's imperfect, it's compromise and it's progress, and I look forward to supporting it. So we just, the General Assembly that you serve in just got done with a special session. We don't need to talk about what that is necessarily, but that's because OTC, OTC Missouri had a $5 billion surplus this year. We have to decide what to do with it. Now there's always a debate as to whether we should tax cut it and give the money back to the people or whether we should make investments. What did the General Assembly decide to do and how do you feel about it? Absolutely. So. To kind of set the stage for this question, again, I think it's important to remember that as Democrats, we don't get to craft the landscape of which we're debating up in Jefferson City, right? So we don't get to pick what bills are filed. We don't get any say over what bills are heard. We don't get a, really any conversation at all about what debate we're going to have on the House floor. So I think this is a good example of something um, that was a really tough decision for me personally. So we had one group of people, a lot of the Republicans, thought that when we had this time of surplus, we should give money back to people. We should have tax cuts. Then we had another group of people, including some Republicans and, and a lot of Democrats, who thought, well, we have this unprecedented surplus. We should do things like invest in our schools, invest in access to mental health services, invest in Missourians. We know, um, you know, kind of factually, we're on the lowest of teacher pay on what we spend on students were the lowest on access to pediatric mental health services. So there are a lot of great areas, um, a lot of great ways we could have invested this money back in our neighbors. I was a person who very much believed that, but I recognized that the landscape was such that we were never going to be able to have those conversations. I was never going to be able to take that surplus and make sure that our teachers got payment or make sure that our kids had access to the mental health services that they needed. 
The tax cut bill that came over from the Senate um, was filed by Senator Lincoln Huff, our senator here in Springfield, and I did end up supporting it. I was one of a handful of my caucus who chose to do so. And I did that, you know, the statement I made earlier, when I'm up there, I do not have my own agenda. My agenda is that of the people in the 135th. And I've knocked, you know, 30,000 doors in the last year, and what people are asking for is help. When inflation's through the roof and gas prices are expensive and rent is skyrocketing, I could not go back to the people in my district and say, I didn't do everything I could to make your life a little bit easier. And when the options were doing that or not investing, I chose that. Um, but I broke from a majority of my caucus on that vote, and that's never fun, as you can imagine. So uh, again, I want to open it up. Before I open it up to the room, a couple questions. One directly inspired by what you just said. This is from Rebecca Webb, an online student. She says, I, I'm quoting in her voice, I have always wondered about this. Prices on everything are skyrocketing, but our pay salaries are staying the same. How are we going to fix this when people are struggling to buy groceries or even get in the car to get to work? What would be a good solution that would be fair to everyone, especially our low and middle class citizens? Absolutely. This is honestly kind of the million dollar question right now. You know, the cost of living, it's not a United States problem uniquely, right? We're seeing it across the globe. Um, inflation is hitting a lot of westernized countries in the same way that it is here in the United States, but that doesn't um, make it any less tragic for the people who are facing it here in Springfield. I was out knocking doors this weekend, um, seeing, I, I don't know if you guys know what subsidized housing is, do you know what that is, kind of state-sponsored housing that's a little bit cheaper. This was specifically for people over the age of 65, and knocking doors, you know, they're, when the cost of living goes up, what they get in Social Security or an SSDI doesn't change. So they're getting squeezed out of their homes or of their rental units because they can no longer afford the increased um, rent and the amount of money that they bring in every month doesn't change. They can't go to work. A lot of them you know, are in their 80s or 90s. A lot of them are, are disabled or facing um, dif difficulties entering into the workforce. And that, those are my hardest doors to knock because you walk away from them thinking, man, how am I going to structurally help this person? I think a lot of it is, you know, you said it, I think the question said it is making sure we have access to jobs that allow us to care for our families. You know, right now in Missouri and a lot of places in the United States, you can work full time out of your home and still live below the poverty limit. Those two things just aren't congruent for me. If we're asking somebody or someone who's entering into the workforce working 40 hours, I think they should be paid a wage that allows them to not live in poverty. I think one of the huge things that I've heard about this year, and I mentioned it earlier, is the work or the child care crisis. You know, it disproportionately affects women. Women are oftentimes the ones expected to stay at home with their kids. And that's great if a woman chooses that or if a dad chooses that, but not when they're doing it only because they can't find access to child care. So I think that kind of plays into the economic argument of, as well of how do we make sure that families, young families, can enter into the workforce? And how do we make sure they do it in a way that they're not spending more on child care than they are making at their job? You know, if you work 15 hours, um, or 40 hours at a $15 an hour job, oftentimes you're paying more to send your three kids to childcare than you would be if you didn't stay at home. So people are gonna make the decisions that are in their own best economic interest. So I know that's an incredibly complex question and of course a lot of those things happen at the federal level. Um, here at the state level, you know, I focus on good paying jobs, access to childcare, and policies that work for Missourians, knowing that a policy I gave this example earlier, but if somebody is going to say no to a promotion because they are going to lose child care assistance, that policy doesn't work. So why don't we build it on a sliding scale so then people are still incentivized to move up and make more money and they're not getting kicked off the one lifeline that they have. A question from two students from 10 a.m. was about Roe v. Wade. Emily Holton asks, what's your opinion on Roe v. Wade, which of course was overturned recently mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court. Jessica Rink says, how do you plan to ensure that the right to every person to their own bodily autonomy and to be free from government intrusion and medical decisions, including the decision whether to carry a pregnancy to term, in light of the current uh, recent Supreme Court decision? Absolutely. So this, I will preface my answer by saying I know this is a very polarizing topic and a lot of you in this room may disagree with me. The Dobbs decision or the overturning of Roe v. Wade um, in Missouri, after that happened, within 24 hours, our Attorney General assigned House Bill 126, which had a, a trigger law in it, which means a, a law that becomes in effect immediately if something else happens. So when Roe was overturned here in Missouri, within a day, we had an, 
uh, an outright abortion ban with no exceptions for rape or incest. So I should set the stage a little bit on this and say in my previous world working at Jordan Valley, uh, for the first three years that I worked there, I delivered pregnancy test results to women who would come in. Sometimes those women would want to be pregnant and cry desperately when they weren't, and sometimes those women uh, would cry when they were. That was really formative, in my opinion, on how a woman should have autonomy over her own body. It was not, uh, an, it was an odd week if I didn't have a child come in who'd been a victim of sexual assault and was scared that she was pregnant or a college student who had been at a party and didn't have any recollection of what happened to her body. And though those are examples of a much larger conversation, those examples happen every day in Missouri. And so what we did here was so far extreme one direction that I think even a lot of people who maybe historically have been on the other side of you know, pro-life or pro-choice, I hate those terms, but that's what people use, now we're seeing us live in this society where the policy has gone so far one direction that I'm knocking doors of Republican men who are saying this isn't okay. I'm knocking doors of Republicans who are 80 years old who have never voted for a Democrat in their whole life and are saying they went too far this time. Equally as concerning to me, we have real conversations on the House floor about access to birth control. My first year, we had a conversation about banning access to birth control for low-income women through the state's Medicaid program, seeing that women couldn't get things like IUDs emergency contraception, plan B, which we know is a completely separate conversation than abortion. Those are really scary precedents, and I'm very fearful for the future of Missouri women if we don't get a rein on this and go back to Jefferson City and codify some of those protections. Um, it is, I think, one of the most polarizing topics that we discuss in Jefferson City, but again, I think if you polled average Missourians that didn't work in Jefferson City, most people would feel like the language that we have in Missouri has gone incredibly too far. There also is no exception for things like ectopic pregnancies. Do you guys know what that are? What ectopic pregnancies are? You know, we there's a woman in St. Louis just, County. Just to be clear, an ectopic pregnancy, non -viable pregnancy is, an, is never, by definition non-viable. And if allowed to, what would you consider, develop, it could cause Kill harm. Yeah. Yes, which we ha already have documented cases of happening in Missouri because physicians, instead of doing their job, are having to call the Attorney General's office and say, hey, is this legal? The last person that I want my doctor calling when they're trying to do what's best for me medically or, or my family medically is a lawyer, right? When you're in a doctor's office, I don't think the government has a role in those conversations. And I think what we saw happen here in Missouri just doesn't serve the interests of women or men who live in this state. Um, really good question for you from Jasmine Specht, because healthcare is kind of your background. Since the pandemic has happened throughout the years, has any of your <clears throat> healthcare experience proceeding from COVID-19, the COVID-19 outbreak, changed your opinion on vaccines, mandates, or quarantining policies, or has it proved why you believe it from a democratic standpoint? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we saw here in Missouri was when COVID hit at the state level, we pretty much stayed out of it and turned all the power down to your local elected officials. So when it came to what businesses stayed open, did schools stay open, um, did you have a mask mandate, did you have a vaccine mandate, those conversations weren't really happening with me up in Jefferson City, they were happening at your city council level. And at the time, I was somewhat critical of that. I wanted state leadership who, in this time of an unprecedented global pandemic, would stand up and say, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that Missourians are safe. I will say, you know, after two years, I've come to much more appreciate local control and how local, um, locally elected bodies should have more say in your day-to-day -day life than people in Jefferson City. So I have kind of come around on that. You know, for me, working in public health and then being an elected official, I do very much still believe that, you know, vaccines are safe. They're the way out of this pandemic. I chose to get vaccinated. Most of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle chose to get vaccinated. What was incredibly disappointing to me was the, how polarizing a COVID vaccine got or how polarizing a conversation of is COVID real or not became. I don't think that served any of us well on any side of the aisle. Um, something I can think of that you know, makes me proud to be a Springfield elected official is we hosted a bipartisan vaccine clinic early on in the pandemic when a lot of Republicans were choosing to um, not get vaccinated or play into a narrative that vaccines weren't good. Our Springfield delegation threw a big vaccine clinic together to show that this isn't a partisan issue. We want our constituency to be safe. I think that was one example of a way we worked across the aisle to benefit our constituency. But, you know, so I think 
to kind of recap, looking back, I do think that our locally elected bodies know what's best for their constituency, and I hope that we're never faced with that challenge again. Okay, well, last question from me for now, before we open it up to the room. This is from Faith Alesh online, and I'm, I think one of the most frequently asked questions was about the votes you guys recently had on unemployment benefits. She says, you voted no on a bill that would reduce the availability of unemployment benefits. Do you think there should be any enforcement to prevent people from avoiding contributing to society by relying on government support during their unemployment, such as age restriction or physical capability examination? Can you ask that again? Yeah, sure. Once again, she's uh, about the, you voted no to reduce the availability of yes. unemployment benefits. Faith asks, do you think there should be any enforcement to prevent people from avoiding contributing to society by relying on government support during their employment. She suggests things like age restriction or even a physical capability examination. Okay. I see. So, you know, for me, the unemployment system is there to support Missouri workers. There are a lot of people in this state who come to a temporary moment in their life when they're unable to work and they've contributed to society for decades and now they're faced with a health condition, they got laid off from their job. You know, I think the, the pandemic was a really good example of that. I don't know if any of you were laid off from your job, but it stunk right through no fault of your own. Now you're faced with this situation where not only were you laid off from your job, but no one else was hiring. And so for me, you know, I, I'm in Jefferson City and I fight for workers. I think the working class is the backbone of our state and we need to continue to build on it and not see these polarizing differences where you have a lot of people who are incredibly, incredibly wealthy and a lot of people who are incredibly poor. The backbone of our of our country has always existed in the middle. And I think making sure that our neighbors have access to things like unemployment is incredibly important. And so for me, no, I, I know the system intimately well. I know the people who run the unemployment system. I don't think that there are a lot of Missourians out there who are using it to their, you know, just to sit at home. There are steps that people have to take in order to receive their unemployment benefits and the state does a good job of making sure those are followed. So for me, I proudly voted no on that one because I think, again, it's really important that when our neighbors are struggling, they have a temporary safety net to make sure that they don't then become homeless, they don't lose custody of their children. It's all intertwined, right? If workers don't have short-term protections when they need it, we're gonna continue to see this, um, very, very stark difference in the upper class and the lower class, and, and I want to get back to a place where we have a strong middle. Okay, and, uh, I want to open it up for a few. Uh, any questions or thoughts for Representative Fogel while we have her here? Um, coming back to Amendment 3, I was just wondering what your opinion was as as you're working up, up there. I mean, um, how do you think it will affect the current medical marijuana industry? Because I've, I've heard a lot of different controversies on, I don't know, these different tax implications and how it might push them out, but I want to know your opinion. Yeah, so of course if recreational marijuana goes through, a lot of people who currently have medical marijuana cards will might, might not choose to get them. I think an important thing to note is that Amendment 3 does favor the companies and corporations that are already benefiting from um, recreation or from medical marijuana. So I don't see a huge tax shift or a huge corporate shift on who is um, able to thrive in that economy. You know, one of the reasons that you're going to hear that Amendment 3 is a good thing is because of the tax revenue that comes from that. That's what we've seen in other states, though that's an important argument. Honestly, it's a little less important to me. For me, it's just knowing that a failed policy isn't working, so what do we do as Missourians to correct that? And again, I'm sure some of you in this room have chosen to smoke recreational marijuana. I'm not gonna ask that question, of course, but do you think the best place for you is incarceration? And I think, you know, for me, it boils down to that question. And then the tax revenue, of course, is an added benefit. If we're going to have something out in our community, I would much rather be regulated, be safe, know that it's not laced with anything else, and of course, the economic benefit is important too. Uh, so, can we talk a little bit about the issues on the ballot? I am not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because I've talked to many of your colleagues in the House, mm -hmm. and I've talked to law professors who I've called begging for explanations, and even those two categories of people struggle with a couple issues that are on the ballot. Absolutely. Um, aside from Amendment Three. Is there an issue on the ballot that you would like to bring our attention to? Why or why not? 
Yeah, so statewide ballot initiatives, Amendment 1 has to do with what the treasurer, the state treasurer can invest our state dollars in. Um, this is another example of a time that my party uh, is coming out in opposition. Personally, I supported that legislation as it moved through the House. As it boils down, it basically it means can the state treasurer invest in higher risk stock and bond options so our state can make a little bit more money. I trust the people of Missouri to send somebody to that position who knows what's best for the economic future of our state and he or she should have the leniency of investing in higher stock op or higher risk options if that's what he or she deems most beneficial to our to our state. Um, amendment 5 is about what are your thoughts on amendment 5? It just seems like a very technical thing about taking the Missouri National Guard and making it its own department. Um, Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so again, um, I think a lot of, especially these initiatives, it just boils down to do people understand? You're gonna see a lot of messaging both directions, or you might not see any messaging both directions because there's not a lot of advocates with a lot of money that care about these issues. Um, I supported that on the floor. Um, I think it's streamlined communication between our governor and our National Guard, and a lot of my caucus members and a lot of caucus members on the other side um, supported that. So we have what are called house joint resolutions. So some of these amendments are amendments that are on the ballot because we voted for them to be on the ballot as your legislature. And then there are some amendments like recreational marijuana that get on the ballot because you guys collect signatures and put it on the ballot yourselves. So the two that you're mentioning are ones that came through the state legislature and I supported both on the floor. And there is, what's flying under the radar is amendment four. This is way more controversial than public recognition understands it. And that is the, if you read the ballot, it looks like we're talking about raising pay for officers, for police officers, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the factual impact is it's only for Kansas City. Absolutely. The state of Missouri is voting on Kansas City's police department. What's going on there? What are your thoughts? So I said this earlier, one thing that I've learned the last two years is the importance of local control and decisions that are made closest to the people, I think are the best decisions for that community. I will preface that by saying anything related to civil or human rights, I think should be made at the highest level possible. So not a fan of the thought of the Supreme Court uh, overturning what I deem to be just civil human rights for all of us. But when it comes to anything else, I think decisions should be made at the local level. What you saw in this bill was the state attempting to come into the city of Kansas City and tell them how much of their budget they had to spend on law enforcement. So regardless of what the issue is, whether it was how much they need to spend on their parks department or on transportation or on anything else, I don't think the state of Missouri should be deciding what the city of Kansas City does and doesn't do with their budget. I would say the same thing if it was any, any example in the world about policy. That would be like the state of Missouri coming into Springfield and saying, Springfield, you have to spend X amount of your budget on this specific thing. So. This was filed by some Kansas City area reps, but all the Kansas City reps who live in the city of Kansas City are against it. And so I think, again, this is a good example of government overreach, in my opinion, that the government's coming in and saying, hey, we don't like what you're doing, or we don't like something about this. And instead of having a policy conversation about how do we address it, this as a state, we're having a micro-targeted conversation about what the city of Kansas City should do. And I just don't think that's appropriate use of the state's dollars for the state legislature. So you mentioned uh, your positions on uh, who somebody should be allowed to love. I just want to bring up, because a couple 